Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see. Good morning, class. How are you? <laughs> so good to see everyone this morning on this brisk morning in Naples. Doesn't it feel great? A uh, little chilly, but it's wonderful. Makes you remember that it's Thanksgiving time and the season of Advent, right? Uh, so we are going to continue our series on the, each of the four Gospels, each of the Sundays leading up to uh, Christmas, with one break in there for Christmas Cookie Sunday. Um, last week we talked about Matthew's Gospel, so today we'll talk about Mark. We're just going to go right in order. Ron, would you help with the door? Do you mind? Thanks. Um, so why don't we begin with a prayer? Gracious Father, we give you thanks for this beautiful day and for the opportunity to come before you and to learn about the one who is to come, which we heard about today in church, or we will hear about shortly. We pray that you would help us to see the ways in which Mark highlights uh, a unique portrait of Jesus in our time together. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. So, um, as I said last week, the, the idea behind this is just to look at each of the four Gospels in a way that we maybe sometimes aren't used to doing, which is the whole gospel all at once and not mixed together with the other gospel accounts. So when you look just exclusively at Matthew's gospel, certain themes and ideas come to the, front, to the forefront that you probably wouldn't notice or that kind of get mixed together and just are in our minds as a general story of Jesus' life. And I should say that there are benefits of doing both of those things. There are benefits of kind of looking at them all together and saying, how can we make sense of this event or this situation? Um, but it's also helpful to kind of look at them independently and say, how is this particular writer crafting the story? Each one of the Gospels is, is a masterfully crafted artistic work and um, describing the historical events of, our, of Jesus, but it's still uh, a literary work that we can study in its own right. You wouldn't say, well, you know, Bach did two passion, you know, chorales that we have, and so they're both about the same story, so they're both the same, you know, they each are very unique, they tell, their, they tell the same story in, sl in different ways. Um, so we did, um, oh, we did uh, Matthew last week, we're on to Mark. Does anyone know the symbol for Mark? You remember? Lion. The lion, very good. Um, so we were moving everything back into the church to get ready, and we came across these lovely um, uh, kneelers. Um, we have these, you don't typically see these, but we do pull these out for like Lent and for some, some of Holy Week and things like that when the clergy kneel on them. This one is St. Mark, the lion, <laughs> but we have one for each of the evangelists. So, so if you ever see us pull these out, you'll know what they look like. So we have the lion uh, on this cushion. Um, we also have special kneelers for bride and groom and things like that, that you, we, we kind of tuck underneath and you don't typically see them. But um, they're very pretty. Uh, so the symbol of Mark's gospel is the lion. Um, what are, if you just throw out, what's, what's the lion a symbol of, ideas? What comes to mind when you think of a lion? Power and strength. Mm -hmm. Yep, royal themes, right? The king, the king of the beasts, that kind of thing. Anything else? Anything maybe less positive? Ferocious, right. A little dangerous. Um, there's um, there's a, uh, the, the, the book that I mentioned last week uh, by Richard Burridge, which is called Four Gospels, One Jesus. Um, the, the kind of recurring theme throughout this chapter is the Narnia stories, where he talks about the Aslan as the lion, the Christ figure, and he's not a tame lion, you know. If, you've, if you know those stories, the, that's a recurring theme. And the idea behind it is to kind of get us a little bit out of our comfort zone, right? He's, he, just because we know God is loving and good doesn't mean it's, everything's going to be easy and, you know, comforting for us. There are going to be times when we need to be challenged. There are going to be times when we need to think about judgment and things like that. So, um, so keep all of those things in mind. The regal, the royal themes, the power... But what goes along with that power is also danger, um, that ferociousness of a lion, 
And also, the lion is, a, is a, a, an animal that kind of pounces on things, right? It's constantly like it stalks and then it pounces. So keep that in mind with Mark, Mark's gospel. Um, this, this symbol was associated with Mark's gospel pretty early on, and, but, the, but there was a question about who does the lion symbolize? Is the, the lion a symbol of the evangelist, Mark, in his retelling? Is it a symbol of Jesus, the main you know, character of the, of the narrative? Or is it, a, is it associated with the gospel because of John the Baptist, who opens Mark's gospel, and he's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So you have this kind of like roaring figure at the beginning of Mark's gospel. So I think the answer is yes. I mean, those are, those are all great reasons why we might associate it with um, this gospel. Um, but we're going to focus on Jesus, the portrait of Jesus in the, in the gospel. Um, all right, so the narrative style the first thing to think about with any of the Gospels is just how are they written, what's the, what's the style of the, of the Gospel as we have it. And Mark's Gospel is like a fast pace, it's a thriller, he moves from one thing to the next to the next, he's constantly moving um, right from the very beginning. If you think about how Matthew's Gospel starts, he says, the, he has this wonderful opening line and then it's the genealogy, nice and slow, I'm going to take my time. 14 generations, and then 14 generations, and then, so it's, it's this beautiful, leisurely pace. Um, Luke's gospel begins with the, the infancy narratives of, not Jesus, but the infancy, infancy narratives of, of uh, John the Baptist, and then Jesus' narrative gets tied in there, and so it's this long kind of parallel journey before they're even born. John's gospel, of course, begins with this prologue, big picture. We're going to talk about all these, but big picture view. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This, you know, talk about a cosmic view of things. And then he starts to kind of narrow things down on Jesus' life. But Mark's gospel is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it was written in the prophet Isaiah. And he jumps right in and ta starts talking about John the Baptist. There's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And then Jesus comes and is baptized, and then he goes out into the wilderness and is tempted, and then Jesus' ministry begins, and all of these things are connected by either a simple and, like this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this, instead of like three days later, or, you know, a week after that, or by the word immediately, which happens more often in Mark's gospel than the entire New Testament combined. So he's constantly saying, immediately this happened, and immediately that happened. Then immediately the disciples came to Jesus, and immediately he said, I mean, it's, if we translated every immediately, it would be almost unreadable in English. Likewise with the ands. Um, so the and is a, is, a, is a Semitic way of, express, of talking. The, the, the Hebrew Bible, is the whole thing is like that. And this, and that, and this, and that, and this, and that. In Mark's gospel, he's retaining that kind of Semitic way of, of talking. But the immediately add that sense of the urgency, the quick pace, the lion is on the prowl, or whatever, however you want to think about it. Another thing that Mark uses, which is um, in some ways, unfortunately, not typically translated into English, is the use of what's called the historic present. So you've, are, you've all heard people talk this way, and it's grammatically incorrect, but they'll tell you about something that happened. So I was in a car accident earlier today, and the police officer says, says to me, you know, in present, you know, like, well, he didn't, he said to you, no, 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 he says, because they want you to, like, be there in the moment. Um, it's, Mark uses that constantly in the gospel. It's, like, all over the gospel. So he says it all the time. <laughs> he says it all the time. Um, so that use of the, again, it's, it's, he wants you to feel like you're right there with him, walking through each of these accounts, each of these stories. Um, also, the first eight chapters of Mark's gospel, there are almost no time markers. Um, like the other gospels, it'll say like on the first day of the week, or three days later, or something like that. This was the Feast of the Jews, you know, the Passover Feast of the Jews. Like Mark's Gospel is very few time markers, which is like 
when you're in a grocery store and there's no windows and no clocks and you, have no, you could be there for 15 minutes or you could be there for three hours and it's all the same. It's, it's light when you go in, but it's dark when you come out. Like those, it's the same kind of feeling in those first eight chapters. No time markers, it's just the story. That's the only thing that matters is what is happening in and through Jesus. Um, he also, um, I already said he links a lot of the passages with and. He also um, rushes around a lot in that first chapter, the first chapter of Mark. If you read that, that's supposed to be like a day in a sense, but it's like way, it's so much stuff to, to do in one day. It's a lot of stuff. Um, what he's doing is he seems to be introducing all of the kind of major, you know, major themes, not themes really, but the, the occurrences, the events that are going to happen in the gospel, he's introducing those in seed form in this one opening, you know, sp sprawl of a, of a narrative. Um, so he talks about Jesus' teaching, his preaching, his healing, his baptism, of course, the conflict narrative, the discipleship, you know, themes of discipleship, the identity questions, who is Jesus, those kinds of things. All of these things happen in the first chapter, and then they're teased out throughout the rest of the narrative. The last thing I'll say is the Mark and Sandwich, which may have been getting you hungry as you're listening to this, this talk. The Mark and Sandwich happens, it's, he's, he's sort of famous for this narrative technique, which is basically uh, two stories where the f one story gets split in half and there's a, a story gets plopped in the middle. So instead of telling the first story and then moving on to the second story, which is what Matthew and Luke do, he tells the first part of the first story, then he tells a completely separate story in the middle, and then he goes back and finishes the first story. Have you no has anyone noticed that as you're just thinking, as you've been coming to church? Has that ever jumped out at you? So let me give you an example of one. Um, the uh, uh, Jesus here, uh, the centurion comes to Jesus and says, my child is sick, will you come heal my daughter who's so sick? So he says, sure. So they're on their way. Then Jesus stops on the way because he says, who touched me? And there's a story of the person who, the woman with the hemorrhage, and she touches Jesus. And the disciples are like, you're in a crowd. What, you know, why are you scared? Why are you, you know? But they have that, they have that whole uh, discussion with the healing of the woman with the hemorrhage. And then after that story is done, or after that concludes, then they go on and finish the story with the centurion. So it's called a sandwich because you have, like, the bread and you have the meat. Okay, and those stories are not, he doesn't do this randomly. They're, they're, again, that's part of the artistry of the gospel. He's putting them together because the two stories are supposed to kind of teach you about one another. Usually the middle story is the main point and it helps you to understand what's happening in the larger story, but it, that's not always the case. But in any case, whenever you see that, another one that's very famous at the end of the gospel, he comes up, he's outside of Jerusalem, right, right this is during Holy Week, he curses the fig tree, and that's all you hear of it. And then they go into Jerusalem. He goes into the temple. He overturns the temple. How are you making this house a house of, uh, you know, my house of prayer, a, a house of commerce? And then he comes back, and the fig tree is withered. And the disciples say, that's the tree you cursed the other day, you know. So two, it's one story that he splits in half, and he puts the, another story in the middle. And it, the, one of the ways you can see these very clearly is if you compare it with the other Gospels, where they, the cursing of the fig tree happens immediately. He curses it, and it withers. Okay, so you get it. So these are all ways that tech, little techniques that Mark uses in terms of the way he structures his Gospel. Um, the first eight chapters, that kind of running through Jesus' ministry, it's all up in Galilee. Um, in John's Gospel, he goes down to Jerusalem, and he comes back up to Galilee, and he goes down to Jerusalem, and he comes back up to Galilee, and he goes down, to, back and forth constantly, at least three times. In Mark's Gospel, it's all in Galilee, then they go to Jerusalem, and it's Holy Week. That's it. So it's a very simple narrative structure in terms of the geography and all that. Um, he, um, he is called a teacher in those first eight chapters a lot. People come up and say, Rabbi, teacher. So clearly he, that's how he was known, um, or one of the ways he was known. But he does very little actual teaching in Mark's gospel in those eight chapters. There are a few parables. There are a few moments where he kind of stops and says, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I want to 
I want to explain something. But for the most part, he's just called a teacher. Whereas, as we saw with Matthew last week, he's not just called a teacher, but he has these huge teaching blocks where all he's doing is just, it's like Jesus said, and then it's open parentheses, and then it goes on for, for chapters. Um, which is why when you get those on a Sunday election, we have to constantly put, you know, Jesus said, or Jesus said to his disciples at the beginning because it happened two chapters ago, but we have to remember, remind you that who is talking. Um, so here, he's just called a rabbi, but he seems to be presented more as a, as a man of action. He's going out and doing things. He's a, he's, this is, he's a miracle worker. He's doing great signs. He's healing. He's casting out demons. He's preaching and teaching, but that's almost like an action in and itself. It's not the content so much that he's focusing on. Um, the other evangelists all talk about Jesus' signs and wonders, especially John's gospel. We'll talk about that when we get to John. But the, the whole first, chap of, first half of John's gospel is sometimes called the book of signs because Jesus does something, and it's very significant. You have to pay attention to what he's doing and why. And it tells you something about who he is and what he's come to do. In Mark's gospel, he never calls them signs. He doesn't call them wonders. He calls them deeds of power. And it really is, it seems to be an expression of, um, A, the, the way that the, the larger crowds perceived Jesus' ministry. Look at, wow, he just did this. You know, they weren't thinking this is a sign of, the, you know, the deeper significance. No, they just, he just did something incredible. I don't understand it. So a deed of power. But it also plays into this theme of conflict in, in Mark's gospel. Mark, they all kind of, all the evangelists talk about Jesus in conflict with other people, other groups. But Mark in particular focuses the, those first eight chapters that may be like the dominant theme of this growing conflict. Conflict with the religious leaders, conflict with his own family, which only shows up in Mark's gospel. You remember there's a this, there's this scene in Mark's gospel where Jesus is the one time where Jesus is teach, says he's teaching, and the, the crowds are all around the outside of the building, and it's, they say, your parents are trying to get to you. And in Mark's gospel, he, it says that the parents were trying to get to them because they thought he had gone mad, essentially. They, there was conflict in the family. Um, and Jesus says, who are my, my mother and my brothers, those who do the will of my father? Uh, so... Um, in Mark's gospel, opposition, conflict is growing, it's mounting. Um, and uh, it's going to be, kind of build to a head to the climax of, of his, his gospel. Um, the reason that Mark tells us there is conflict between the religious leaders and Jesus, between his family and Jesus, between even his, his own disciples and Jesus, is because of who Jesus is, because of his identity, and specifically because of misunderstandings about his identity. Um, obviously, if Jesus is not who he says he is, then he, need to, he, is, he needs to be opposed, right? Um, so the religious leaders don't know what to make of Jesus, and it sounds pretty blasphemous, right? It sounds like pretty dangerous. So you can understand their conflict. The family, you know, you can just imagine someone that you knew from this high growing up, and all of a sudden he's saying these things, and you're thinking, this is my brother, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, that's quite a challenge. You can imagine for them to kind of get into that mindset of where we would eventually come to see who Jesus was. But what Mark is doing in these opening chapters is he's explaining that conflict. He's also explaining it by a very unique feature of his gospel, which is sometimes called the messianic secret. Shh. You may have noticed in Jesus's healing ministry, he'll heal someone and he'll say, don't tell anyone. Or someone will say, you are the Messiah, and he says, don't tell anyone. Over and over and over again. So they, the scholars are kind of cute. So they named this the messianic secret, the secret that he's, he is the Messiah, but it's a secret. Shh, don't, don't tell anyone. So what what, what ends up, you know, in Mark's gospel, we can see very clearly why that's going on. Jesus doesn't want to be misunderstood. He doesn't want, he doesn't do anything before his time, right, that my time has not yet come. So 
those first eight chapters, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of kind of glimpses of insight. Who is this who even the wind and the waves obey? Who is this who can forgive sins? Constantly kind of getting us to think about his identity. Who is this guy? You know, I thought only God could do that. I thought, you know, the Messiah was going to come and do that. Who is this? Um, little glimpses here and there, but mostly misunderstanding. And it builds up to uh, the kind of climax of one of the early climaxes in, Math, in uh, Mark's gospel, the hinge moment of the gospel, which is the confession of St. Peter in, at Caesarea Philippi. So this is that you know, wonderful moment. Peter gets it right and then gets it really wrong. Um, right before this, this happens, there's the healing of the blind man in two stages, right? This is the first time like a miracle of Jesus. Jesus doesn't seem to work the first time. He, he, try, he, says, he touches his eyes and he says, can you see, or what do you see? And the man says, I see humans, but they're like trees walking. And then he touches him again, and he sees clearly. And a lot of people have, you know, I mean, this is clearly supposed to tell us something about, you know, Jesus could have healed the person straight away. He does it every other time. So what is this supposed to teach us? Well, what happens immediately after that is the disciples go up to Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus says, who do, who do people say that I am? Elijah, one of the prophets, right? John the Baptist. Who do you say that I am? And the crickets and everyone's silent for a while. And then John the Baptist, I mean, then Peter, <laughs> John the Baptist. And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the, the son of the highest one. And Peter sa- and then Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, you know, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Great, I mean, he gets this, tons of praise. And then he, Jesus immediately goes on to say, he, what he was saying at that point, what Peter was saying is, we finally get it. You're the Messiah, right? We're sure about this now. You're the Messiah. And Jesus says, yes, very clearly. But he says, the Messiah must go and suffer. And Peter says, wait a second. I, we thought you were the Messiah, and you just said you have to go and suffer in Jerusalem. You know, this is not what the Messiah is supposed to do. So you see there's two stages going on. He gets the first stage right. He gets all that misunderstanding. Yes, I see through all that. You are the Messiah. What he misunderstands still is what is, what, who is the Messiah and what has he come to do? So from that point on, as they journey from Caesarea Philippi way in the north all the way down to Jerusalem, is Jesus teaches them about what it means to follow him. And what does it mean to follow him? To do what he's about to do, right? Um, to follow in his footsteps. Um, okay, that's probably good. So, there he's talking about discipleship. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He set his face to Jerusalem. It's all about following Jesus. There's a kind of a mysterious uh, flavor to Jesus in Mark's gospel. In Matthew's gospel, as we said, he comes out and he kind of lays his cards on the table. This is who Jesus is. And then he does ask a lot of the same questions. Who is this? Who does this? Who is this? Who forgives sins? But the whole time, Matthew, as the narrator, knows, and he's kind of getting, he wants you to say, see what I'm talking about? You know, I'm telling you. Whereas Mark, it's, he, what he wants you to do is be kind of like sucked into the story as if you were one of the disciples. He wants you to be confused at first. He wants you to not know what's going on. Imagine not, not knowing the story and hearing it for the first time. He, what, he, what he doesn't want you to do is to say, to come out and kind of turn you off by saying, this is who Jesus is. He came to suffer and die. And people are like, wait a second. You know, I don't... He, what he wants you to do is say, there was something was going on in the Judean wilderness, and there were crowds came, and they were, you know, he said this, and it, it was perplexing, and then Jesus did this, and people were like, how could you do that? You know, you're drawn into the story. You're one of the disciples walking around with Jesus. And Jesus says, you know, that kind of thing. So... Um, there's some kind of mystery to the figure of Jesus as he's going through the Gospels. And Mark, obviously, is going to eventually get to the point where Matthew and Luke and John are, but he wants the reader to really get there themselves. He wants you to make all of those movements and decisions for you personally as you go through the Gospel, which is why it's actually one of the most kind of friendly Gospels to, to someone who has never heard of anything about Christianity because he really kind of starts at the beginning and just 
tells you the story. Um, so they get to Jerusalem. This is Holy Week. He's proclaimed his message. And now the question is, he has the authority, right? We know that Jesus actually has this authority. But those who are in authority are going to be in conflict with him. And the question is, what are people going to do? How are they going to respond to Jesus' claims now that he has basically come out and said, I'm laying my, ta- my cards on the table? Um, uh, this is one of the areas where we see this, the figure of the lion showing up. Um, the lion, again, as you said, David, has a sort of regal figure. This is true in the Old Testament as well. There's a couple key passages, which I, I didn't bring a Bible, but I'll just have to tell you about them. In, uh, at the end of Genesis, uh, Jacob is giving the blessing to his, the, the tribes, his sons, after, right before he dies. And so each of the tribes, he says, you know, Reuben, this is what I'm going to say about you. Asher, this is what I'm going to say, each of them. And then he gets to Judah, and he talks about the Judah as a lion's whelp, and how he's going to have, be, have the scepter of the kingdom, and he's going to rule over his brothers, you know, etc. So he, there's this regal image built into that blessing to, uh, from Jacob to his sons. And the New Testament picks up on this image, especially in the book of Revelation, Revelation 5, where it says uh, the, the, the lion from the tribe of Judah will conquer through his death. So you get this image of a lion. Jesus is portrayed as a lion, and then they, the crowds turn around and they look back, and it looks like a lamb that was slain. You know, this, that's this beautiful symbolic way of showing he's both of those symbols. He's the lion, he's the king, but he's also the sacrificial animal. So it's, uh, if you ever get to that and you're like, I thought we were looking at a lion a second ago. Yeah, it's the same, same figure. Um, so this lion will triumph through suffering and death. This is the, you know, the paradox of the cross. So everything gets turned on its head. Jesus has authority, but he's the one being kind of led around from this place to that. He's going kind of wherever everyone is bringing him. Um, there's a growing rece- rejection. Uh, people are asking, do you have the authority to do your, the things you're doing? Um, and I already told you that sandwich structure between the judgment on the fig tree and the judgment on the temple or the, you know, um, the um, cursing of the fig tree and the judgment on the temple. Um, then Jesus comes back out from Jerusalem. He's sitting on the Mount of Olives, and he gives the, the largest teaching block in, Mark, in Mark's gospel, which is the chapter 13. It's almost the, in, it's the entire chapter, basically. And this is called the Little Apocalypse. This is like Revelation, the book of Revelation, condensed to one chapter and put at the end of the gospel. This is where Jesus is talking about, we heard something like it from Luke's gospel today, um, the, you know, the, the, all the sort of, the heaven and earth will show the signs of his coming when he comes again, and there's going to be judgment, and there's going to be uh, rescue, and, and justice finally done. And um, the, if you look at, in Mark's gospel, this teaching unit does a lot of things. It does what it does in the other synoptics, which is tell Jesus is, what he's, what he's talking about, what's going to happen next, the, net, the, la, the last things. But in Mark's gospel, it also ties together all the loose ends, all the things that he's been talking about up to this point. All of the themes come together in those last, um, in that last chapter before. Um, and the way that they do is, remember, the, the growing conflict is a result of misunderstanding about Jesus' identity. So you have conflict and misunderstanding, you have Jesus' teaching on his own identity in two or three chapters in the middle of the gospel where he says, I am the Messiah, but I have, I'm, I'm the suffering servant. I've come to offer my life as a ransom for many. He's teaching them what it, when you follow me, you take up your cross and follow. All of those things. So he is, it's like they've gotten to this point, and then now he's turning everything on its head. And then when we get to Jerusalem, he says, it's going to look like everything is on its head, but it's really right side, you know, it's finally up, right side up. So you see this beautifully in Mark's gospel. In Mark's gospel, the, the, um, Jesus on the cross, it's a, it's a dark, it's not a bright situation. It's not, Jesus is not like in control like in John's gospel where he's telling people what to do. And, um, it's, it's someone being led to execution. And he 
just describes it that way. So it's the d darkness over the sky. Jesus doesn't say anything. He gets to the crowd, the, on the, the cross. The only thing he says on the cross is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a pretty bleak scene. If you only had Mark's gospel, it would be hard to, to you know, it would be hard to, to approach. Um, but what you see, what Mark is trying to get us to see is something that um, J.S. Bach actually did beautifully in John's passion, in the passion of John, which is on the cross, Jesus has, is the conquering lion. He's the one who has, from, lion from the tribe of Judah, who has conquered and is victorious. So you're supposed to see this dark, I mean, the way that the rest of the world saw it, this very bleak, dark picture, and what you're supposed to see is the victory of God. So if I, if I can get this to work, I'm going to try to play you a little uh, clip. This is one little, one little movement from uh, the St. John Passion, and the translation is next to you. Es ist vollbracht, is it is finished. That's how the world sees it. This is how Mark wants us to see it now.
So if that spoke to you musically, the idea behind what Mark is trying to do there is that that just sort of that beautiful melodram mel melodrama, the, the darkness, the sorrow. But he says underneath all of that, what's going on is the lion of the tribe of Judah conquering. Um, uh, so whether that was helpful or not, I'm not sure. Um, the lion conquers, of course, through death. All of the themes of his gospel now come together, power and conflict discipleship and misunderstanding. We see what, you know, what true discipleship looks like because we see that everyone has misunderstood Jesus and his true identity, his identity and his authority, his kingship and how it's connected to his suffering. And, um, and then we see in the trial and the, uh, the trial of Jesus, we see his true identity come out. Peter's denial and Jesus's own confession, right? Peter who says, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. And he bears false witness, and Jesus bears true witness. Um, Jesus on the trial. This is one of this is the the clearest moment in all the gospels, but it's the first moment in in Mark's gospel where Jesus like, gives a sort of straight yes answer to Are you the Messiah? He says, I am, which is again that way of describing. It's the way of sort of naming God in the Old Testament. I am. Um, and you will see the Son of Man seated on the, the clouds of heaven, coming on the clouds of heaven. So he picks up that image from Daniel 7 of the one who is coming to rule with authority, the king, the coming king. And Mark continually, continuously uses irony throughout the whole gospel, and it's very thick in the, in the passion narrative. Um, we see um, he's anointed for his burial. He's anointed as king for his burial, so there's a double meaning there. He's described as the king of the Jews over and over again, but again, in, usually in a mock way or an ironic way. And this, the soldiers, again, in mock homage, put a robe on him, you know, strike him. Um, oh, sorry, one more. Um, you also see the irony of Mark's understanding of, of e evil and the providence of God. Um, the irony is that Jesus is, that people are, are conf confronting Jesus, they're trying to stop him from, do, from doing whatever he's doing, and the irony is that they're fulfilling God's purpose in doing that. Um, so the cross, again, is the key that unlocks all of the puzzling elements in the gospel, the things that didn't make sense as you were going through them, all of a sudden make sense um, in terms of the larger narrative. Um, Mark's gospel ends with the same sort of, sort of ambiguity and the same kind of questioning tone that it begins with. Um, in, in all the other gospels, you have some sort of fairly elaborate, in terms of drawn out, resurrection story. In Mark's account, uh, in your Bibles, it, it, the first eight, ch eight verses of that last chapter, and then after that, they'll sometimes include, this is not part of the earliest manuscripts, but, you know, it, it got tagged on later. But those first eight verses, they talk about the women coming to the tomb, Jesus' tomb being empty, and it says the angel tells them to go, he's, he's raised. There's an announcement of his resurrection, and then it says that they left because they were afraid. We don't know if they went and told. We don't know what the dis male disciples did. You know, we don't, there's no actually, a, there's no appearance of Jesus, the raised Jesus. So that secrecy, that ambiguity that the gospel begins with, and it's been working through the whole narrative, it continues even into the resurrection account. Um, the question that he's trying to get the disciples and the reader to ask are the questions like, who is this? Will they follow or abandon him? Will they believe or will they misunderstand? And just like he wanted you to be part of his early ministry, just like he wanted you to kind of be sucked into the story and be standing with Jesus at the foot of the cross, he also wants you to be, feel the kind of, the, the, the fear, the excitement, the, 